What is up Netflix fans and welcome back to my channel. It's the video I have been preaching about for the last few weeks and here we are. We are at the end of 2018. I can't believe we are already here and this is not my favorite movies of the year. This is my favorite Netflix movies of the year. So we are focusing on Netflix original films. My list is completely subjective. These are my favorites. These are not in order of least amount of quality to most amount of quality. No, this is like which one did I like the most? Which one did I like? Not the least, but which one is number 10 on my list? We will do least favorites tomorrow. That list will be coming out probably around the same time tomorrow as it did today. But today, let's keep it on a positive note. This is your space to talk all things Netflix. Get down in the comments section below and put your lists, your number 10 through 1, everything you guys want to talk about. Feel free to talk about it. And minor spoilers for this list, but not really. These are movies that I'm going to recommend to you guys, so I will not be giving away any major plot points. I have talked enough clearly and before I get into number 10 let's give some honorable mentions some movies that I still think are worth watching and we start with The Land of Steady Habits, Camp, Bleach, Kodachrome, Next Gen, Hold the Dark, and The Christmas Chronicles. Now those aren't the only movies that I like that would be on my honorable mentions but I didn't want to make that list too long. Go check those movies out if you haven't seen them. Let's get into number 10. <music> Number 10, a movie that I did not anticipate liking, but that is The Ritual. I really enjoyed this really creepy, horrifying at times movie with an incredible creature towards the end of the film. This movie is just horror done right. It's slow, it's steady, it takes time to build up his characters. It's not the most entertaining movie I've watched all year, but I thoroughly enjoyed how creepy it gets towards the third act. And like I said about the creature design, genuinely one of the scariest monsters I have seen all year. The way that they mix CGI with practical effects. It was horrifying and you are attached to our lead character because the acting is so good. Even the flashback scenes, everything that it shows to give him somewhat of a backstory, you get connected to him. The Ritual is a really cool foreign horror film. If you like slow and steady at the end of the day, that wins the race in the case of The Ritual and this one is worth watching. <laughs> At number nine, one thing that I have not liked about Netflix this year is that they have thrown out so many bad and predictable teen rom-coms. Just something that I watch and I'm like, I will never watch that again. I don't know why I watched it in the first place. And many movies that will have their place on my worst list. But right now we are talking best, and right now we are talking about the best of the bunch, one that is getting a sequel confirmed, and that is To All the Boys I've Loved Before. This was genuinely interesting. This film was engaging, great characters, well-written, a likable father figure, and you are on board with her story the entire time. The love interests, but most importantly, the love interest is really good, and it has this, it's an odd comparison, but this John Hughes feel to it, not necessarily necessarily in the humor, but just the way that it's paced and especially the ending. And it does set up a sequel, but it's a good movie in its own right. I genuinely enjoyed this film. I laughed at it. It's not necessarily for my age group. It's more for teenagers, but I do think it hits that audience, that target audience that will be watching, loving, and appreciating the movie. It hits it on the head, and uh, I can't wait to see the next one. <laughs> Number eight, and we are talking slow. This one is probably the slowest of the bunch, and a lot of people found this movie boring, but since it's my personal list, I did not find it boring. I found it genuinely engaging, and that's mostly because it set up really good characters, and I cannot believe Martin Freeman was so good in this movie, and that is Cargo. This is a different style zombie story. It's one that I really liked for a long time. I went back and revisited about 20 minutes of the movie just to be like, okay, did I really like Cargo that much? And I have started to get invested in the characters again. I genuinely enjoyed this movie. It is a spin on the zombie franchise. It's very slow paced, which like I said, will draw a lot of people away from it, but it's something that gets you invested in the characters. And that level of tension and intensity that is built up throughout the movie and then the kind of payoff in the third act, I think it's interesting. I think it's worth a watch. I think it has great performances. And Cargo is another really good movie on Netflix if you have time to just sit there and kind of soak all of the character development in because that's what the movie is. <laughs> 
At number seven, this was one of my most anticipated movies of the year, directed by the guy who brought us Hell or High Water, which is one of my favorite films of the decade. This is Outlaw King. This is David McKenzie at the helm, Aaron Taylor Johnson and Chris Pine, and a really a great cast, but great performances. I thought everyone in this movie was genuinely interesting. A lot of people have issue with Chris Pine. They say he doesn't fit the role, and he is definitely different than what you expect that character to be, and definitely not like his character in Braveheart, but I liked what they did with it. I like the direction that they went in. It's very slow. The pacing's not the best at times, but the way that this movie looks, the natural lighting, the cinematography, which is something David McKenzie always does well, and the story, by the time you get to the third act, you are invested in Chris Pine's character. You care about that battle at the end and the bloody battles and just the blood in general. This is a really good testament of what you can do on Netflix without having to worry about the television restrictions and the ratings like in theatrically released movies. Outlaw King did a lot of things right. It wasn't as good as I wanted it to be, but I still really enjoyed it enough to put it on my top 10 list and to put it at number seven. Next up is a movie that shocked me. Where did this come from? I, I didn't hear tale of this film until I saw the very first trailer, and that was right before I saw the movie, and that is Private Life. Private Life was such an engaging story between a couple who just wants to have a kid, and some things happen with certain family members, the drama and the interaction and the conversations, and really, this film is about assisted reproduction and adoption, and it hits on very straight-to-the-core plot points points and elements that will get a lot of people emotional because this is something that people deal with in everyday life. It is genuinely interesting what this couple goes through and Private Life holds some of the better, I guess, dramatic performances of the year. Katherine Hahn and Paul Giamonti are great in this movie. Their interaction, their conversations, everything that goes on between them is some of the most interesting stuff I've seen on Netflix and it's just living life. It's going through every single day having different small issues to some people but major issues to them come up and just seeing how that plays out and watching the end of this movie it was engaging it was emotional it was really well done not the most entertaining movie I've seen all year and that's why it's not higher but I genuinely enjoyed private life and it kind of shocked me next up is a film that just, whoa, this thing pushes all of the limits. It's intense, it's scary, it's thrilling. It is from a great director, the director of The Raid, and that is Apostle. I thoroughly enjoyed Apostle. I liked a lot of the stuff that I saw on screen from the visuals, from just the twisting camera angles and the creepy elements and the performances from Dan Stevens and Michael Sheen. Michael Sheen, who is a completely different character than what we're used to, but he is so good in this film. It's about a guy who travels to an island to find his missing sister, and then he realizes she has been kidnapped by this freaky cult. And that aspect is interesting enough, but then you start to dive into the island and things that are alive on the island and all of these elements bring together a really cool, not as action-packed as I anticipated. It slows down at moments and then picks back up. When it slows down, it's not the most entertaining movie I've seen all year, but Apostle is interesting, it's intense, it's kind of scary, and the ending will leave a lot of people thinking. Is Ballad Buster Scruggs. This is a movie that uh, is going to be very divisive with some people because there are elements that are great, there are elements that aren't as great because this film is a film that was split up into six different stories and while I didn't love every single story, I still really enjoyed the majority of them. The first three or four that I thought were genuinely good or great, especially the Gold Prospector one, uh, that is some of the best cinematography and lighting and color correction that I have seen all year. Such a wonderful scene. There are so many great actors in this movie and every story, while it does in a way interweave more thematically and more in a way that you have to think about, it doesn't all come at face value, but once you sit down and think about how they kind of interweave emotionally, then I think you'll really enjoy this movie. And while the last two weren't the most entertaining ones I've ever seen, I was really invested with most of this film. I love the characters. I think Tim Blake Nelson was perfect as Buster Scruggs. He was so good. 
I like James Franco. I like Liam Neeson. I loved Tom Waits. His story was probably my favorite, but The Ballad of Buster Scruggs is just an interesting story. The Coen brothers, they always, well, most of the time, they hit the nail on the head, and while they didn't perfect this film, I do think there's a lot of elements that are there that are going to set a precedent for this style of movie in the future, and I'm really glad they did it. Maybe it would have worked better as a television show, but I still thoroughly enjoyed this film. This one is going to be one that a lot of people haven't heard of, and I hadn't heard of it. I just watched it because I've been watching Netflix movies, and this just so happened to be the new one that came out that weekend. And this was The Night Comes for Us. The Night Comes for Us is a fantastic foreign film from some very creative directors that bring those action scenes that you have seen before in movies, once again mentioning a movie like The Raid. But this is just a completely different style of story, and you are there and locked in because the characters are, yes, compelling. If you read subtitles and you don't mind that, then you will get into and get invested with these characters. But more importantly, the action scenes are definitively the best hand-to-hand -hand combat action scenes that I have seen all year. Number one, out of all the movies I've seen, this is the best action, and that's because the stunt and the fight choreography is perfect. It looks real. It is real. I don't know how this wasn't real. Oh wait, it wasn't real? Okay. I don't know if I believe that because the violence was just filmed and handled and choreographed so perfectly and they take chances. They do different styles of kills here and the punches are so impactful. The blood is so realistic. Everything about this movie was just straight up entertaining. The crime thriller action aspect is just so good. You're not necessarily there for the characters, but they're not bad. I did have some issues within the script. That's not why this movie was made. The movie was based around the fight choreography, like I said, the best I have seen this year. If you love a good foreign action film, then The Night Comes For Us is one that you are not, not going to miss. You have to see this movie on Netflix. My goodness. <laughs> Next up is a film that I don't know if it's going to crack the top three on most people's lists, but for some reason, 22 July, the 22nd of July, is one that I just, I think back on and I think of how impactful the story was, and a lot of people who were there who commented on my review, not in a negative way, everyone was actually really nice in that comment section, but they commented on my review and they said, well, there is a foreign film that kind of hits these points a little bit better, and I did have a few people comment and say, I was in this country when this happened, and it really did not hit on the emotion impact and I completely understand that but this is a story that I did not know very well I had heard of it I knew that it happened but I didn't get to dig in deep and this movie really does a good job of showing someone who doesn't know anything about this story the actual impact and how this community rallies around the survivors of the attacks and how the political leadership and the lawyers involved they go about so not solving the case but they go about providing comfort in the aftermath of this tragedy in Norway that killed 77 young people at a youth camp and the first scene of this movie actually shows it happen. It shows it all down. I thought the movie would do a little bit of build up, but we jump right into it. I loved that storytelling decision. I think Paul Greengrass, one complaint a lot of people have is that he makes light of these situations and he Hollywoodizes it, but I didn't see that here. I saw 22 or the 22nd of July, a very impactful movie. There's a lot of emotion there. There's a lot of stakes. I really liked this main character that kind of speaks up at the end and you get to hear about this tragedy. In a way, it's a heartwarming story. It does get a little slow at the end. A lot of people are going to find that boring, but seeing this tragedy play out and how this community kind of rallies around each other, in my opinion, was super interesting, and that makes it my second favorite movie on Netflix this year. It's not one that I'm necessarily going to revisit it because I don't want to watch that first scene again, and without the first scene, you don't have the rest of the film, but the 22nd of July is one of the better movies I have seen this year. Maybe uh, the single most predictable thing you guys have ever seen in your lives, but I, I can't put anything above this, and this movie is so good that it's probably going to be in my top 10 overall 
of the year. And none of these other movies are even being considered for that list. But Roma did everything I wanted it to do and more. I saw the trailer. I saw Alfonso Cuaron as the director. I saw all of the elements that were going to make this movie great. I just didn't know how great it was going to be, but it ended up being genuinely the most emotionally invested I've been in a film in a long time. It's a Netflix movie, so I didn't watch this thing in the theaters. It's not in a theater around me right now, mostly because I live in Kentucky, but I still got to sit back and enjoy this in the comfort of my own home. Thank goodness I was by myself because there were tears that were shed because I got locked into this family. I got locked into this tragedy and the emotion was just so surreal. And that could all come down to the style, the way in which it was filmed. It was filmed so beautifully. The cinematography was perfect. The color correction, the black and white, was perfect. There were elements of this movie that were imperfect, but the majority, I would say, what did I give this movie? A 98%? I would say 98% of this movie was perfect. It was done in a way that really, if you can get past that first hour, not get past it because I still thought it was super well done, I just wasn't as invested as I think the movie wanted me to be, but once an event happens in the film, you are, well, I was on board with Roma, locked in from there on out. I still think the first hour is gorgeous and you're locked into the storytelling, just not necessarily the characters, but once you get locked into the characters, the movie has almost the perfect finale and the perfect finish, and that is why Roma is my number one favorite Netflix movie of the year and possibly one of my favorite movies of the year, but we'll just have to stick around until next week to find that out because I've not even finalized that list yet, but I have finalized my Netflix list. Thank you guys so much for watching this video. Go down in the comment section. What was your favorite Netflix film of the year? Don't say what was your least favorite because that list is dropping tomorrow. My top 10 worst Netflix movies of the year. Every weekend, every Friday, I'm reviewing something on Netflix and I will continue that trend throughout 2019. So if you have friends, if you know people who love Netflix and you just want to see a review because not a lot of people are doing it, please recommend this channel to them because not that I want to inform you, not that I want to force you, I just want to give you guys an opinion on something that you can find on your television. You can sit back, relax, and oh, is this movie worth watching? Is this movie not worth watching? Well, that's what I'm here for, hopefully. And if you guys don't feel that way, that's absolutely fine, but thank you. I thoroughly can't thank you enough for 2018 and all of the love you have given given me on my Netflix videos. I will be back tomorrow with my top 10 worst. You guys are the absolute best, and I'll catch you later.